I want you to know, I don't intend on dancing around the issue here. This video is about why love poems are dumb. By the end of this video, I promise you that your opinion of love poems will be entirely changed and you will be living in a newer, better world, finally free of the oppressive lies that society has been telling you. Oh, love poems are so cute, they're so romantic. Wrong! That's just what they want you to think. But don't worry, I'm about to red pill you so hard that you're going to see through this false simulation called acceptance, and soon you too will be on your way to spreading the truth. So without further ado, let's get into it. First thing we've got to do is answer some preliminary questions that are essential to understanding this argument. Number one, what is a poem? Merriam-Webster's dictionary defines poetry as a composition in free verse and something suggesting a poem. So that's not useful at all. I mean, we can sit here all day and try to decipher that, but we have quotas to meet and appointments to keep, so let's look at what a professional writer of poetry, otherwise known as a poeticist, has to say on the subject. Poetry is ordinary language raised to the nth power. Poetry is boned with ideas, nerved and blooded with emotions, all held together by the delicate, tough skin of words. Paul Engel, from an article in the New York Times. To translate that into normal people words, poetry is ideas, emotions, and words put together into fancier sounding words. There might also be something in there about, like, how to create artificial life, which is weird, but you know what? D don't worry about that. Uh, you'll understand more as we move forward. Now that we know what poetry is, half of our thesis has been defined. But how do we know what qualifies as dumb? Well, actually, we're in luck. For all of human history, the answer to this question had been lost to time. But in 1994, the film Dumb and Dumber was released. Now, it's never actually revealed which of the two main characters in Dumb and Dumber is supposed to be dumb and which one is supposed to be dumber. But by analyzing the film in depth, we're able to essentially reverse engineer the meaning of dumb by identifying moments in which both dumb and dumber are present. To do this, we're going to analyze the pepper scene. For a bit of context, the two main characters have just eaten some very hot peppers and are trying to nullify the spiciness. Let's take a look and see if we can decipher the true definition of dumb. Yeah, I, I think, I, I don't know, I don't think it even actually matters which one was dumb and which one was dumber in that scene. Uh, I'd say it's safe to give dumb the working definition of not having any purpose, like, at all. Ugh, I have to, like, do some math or something to feel less secondhand stupidity from that. Now that we finally laid down the groundwork and identified what exactly a poem is and what we mean when we say dumb, we can finally get into the real meat of this video, where I'm going to prove to you why love poems are dumb. Have you ever heard the saying, wide as an ocean, deep as a puddle? Well, that's basically love poems. When it comes to love poems, there's only so much that you can actually do. You can profess your love, you can describe the feeling of love, or the object of your love, but that's basically it. At the end of the day, there's only so many fancy ways to say, I love you. To prove my point, let's take a look at some famous poems and translate them to their core themes and questions. Our first example will be Sonnet 18. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. 
Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, And often is his gold complexion dimmed, And every fair from fair sometime declines, By chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, Nor lose possession of that fair thou owest, Nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade, When in eternal lines to time thou growest, so long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. Translation Not only are you really pretty, like a summer's day, but you're also really nice. And you're like, always nice. Unlike a summer's day, because sometimes those aren't nice. But not, not you. You're like, always nice. Next example will be, How do I love thee? How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. I love thee to the depth and breadth and height my soul can reach when feeling out of sight for the ends of being and ideal grace. I love thee to the level of every day's most quiet need by sun and candlelight. I love thee freely as men strive for right. I love thee purely as they turn from praise. I love thee with the passion put to use, in my old griefs and with my childhood's faith. I love thee with a love I seem to lose with my old saints. I love thee with the breath, smiles, tears of all my life. And, if God choose, I shall but love thee better after death. Translation I really, 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 really love you. Like a whole lot. Now these are just two examples, but they were the first results when I googled best love poems ever. So as far as I'm concerned, this is as good as it gets. OBJECTION! Our first example of a poem with actual depth will be The Road Not Taken by Robert Frost. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both and be one traveler. Long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other just as fair, and perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear. Though, as for that the passing there, had worn them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay in leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. Translation. Some dude is standing in the woods and decides to take the road that most people don't take, and it's made a difference. Wait a minute. What kind of difference did it make? It doesn't tell me. Well, now I'm interested. This makes me want to think. It makes me want to ponder the natural world. I think I might need to get a doctor in philosophy just so I can properly think about this poem. This isn't like the love poems that just describe something using fancy words. There's actual intention and meaning here. Everybody who reads this poem can probably point to a time in their lives where they felt they took the road less traveled by and reflect on the difference it's made for them throughout their lives. Now that is depth. Now I know that pulling out Robert Frost isn't exactly fair. It's essentially the equivalent to when kids try to pull gun in rock, paper, scissors, like, there's only three options, Tommy. Rock, paper, and scissors. You can't just say gun and expect us to act like you want- Anyways, let's try analyzing a lesser known poem by the name of What If You Slept by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. What if you slept? And what if in your sleep you dreamed? And what if in your dream you went to heaven and there plucked a strange and beautiful flower? And what if when you awoke you had that flower in your hand. Ah, what then? I'm just, every time, 
I read that poem, I feel like another layer of my mind has been unlocked, and I'm given just a brief glance into heaven itself. I can't even begin to fathom how any other poem could stand up to this one. You want to talk about questions? The title is a question. Every single verse is a question. The poem itself is basically just one big question. Where love poems begin and end with one basic subject, poems like The Road Not Taken and What If are just springboards upon which you can launch yourself into more complex thought and theory. I feel like I've beaten the horse enough that it's probably not long for this world, so I say we shift directions. I just did the whole depth thing, but that's only one reason why love poems are dumb, and I have plenty more evidence to support my argument. That was my segue. I couldn't really think of a fun way to transition from parts one to part... <laughs> ask you a question. What comes to your mind when you think of the word cool? Is it a guy wearing sunglasses as he walks away from an explosion? Is it pretty much any action scene from the John Wick series? Maybe you think of the song Cool by the Jonas Brothers. I mean, this novel first came to my mind, but teach their own. Oh, do you want to know what's really cool? Uh, that scene from Rogue One where the rebels are trying to get away with the Death Star plans, and then it gets real quiet, and it's dark, and then... Oh, that's so cool. Now, I know I definitely didn't list every possible cool thing that you could have thought of, but I guarantee you that one thing you did not think of when asked what's cool is love poems. But why aren't love poems cool? Well, simply put, love is the antithesis of cool. But wait, sub-question to the original question, what is cool in the first place? Before making this video, I couldn't really define cool if you asked me to. I knew that this... ...was cool, but I couldn't really tell you why. But, being the resourceful and driven student that I am, I developed two very specific intrinsic traits that can be found in anything that one may consider cool. Number one, cool things exude an aura of uncompromising confidence in oneself. An example of this can be seen in action movies where the protagonist is just so extremely good at what he does that he's unfazed by any of the ordeals he has to overcome. Group ships, staggered line, shipmaster, they outnumber us three to one. Then it is an even fight. Oh, it's so cool. But this tenet can also be applied to things that would make you feel extremely confident in yourself. Like giant robots. Giant robots aren't cool because they themselves are confident, but you know that if you had a giant robot, your self-esteem would probably benefit from it. This actually leads right into number two. Cool things will make you want to emulate slash imitate them. Or, they'll make you want to wish that you could. I like to dub this the Super Saiyan effect. If you don't know what a Super Saiyan is, it's a phenomenon from the show Dragon Ball Z, where a character will scream until his hair turns blonde and his eyes turn blue in order to power up. Once they become a Super Saiyan, the character becomes super strong, super fast, and they can even shoot lasers from their hands. Although Dragon Ball Z itself isn't for everyone, I know for a fact that if you had a chance to get superpowers just by screaming really loud, you would try it. And many, many people have. Now you might think these people look stupid, and they kind of do, but honestly, you can't really blame them. Having superpowers is inherently cool, and as the second law of cool states, cool things will make you want to emulate them, or wish that you could. So maybe, you never tried to go Super Saiyan, but don't even try to tell me that you've never tried to read someone's mind, or try to lift something with the force, 
because we've all done it at least once. It's just a side effect of witnessing cool things. So now that we've established the dual tenets of coolality, as I like to call them, we can use them in furthering our discussion on love poems. So let's get back to that. But why aren't love poems cool? Let's look at the rules of cool and see if love poems have either. Do love poems exude an aura of uncompromising confidence or make you feel more confident? I mean, being in love might make you feel that way, but a love poem itself isn't going to have that effect. Do love poems make you want to emulate them or wish that you could? I guess if you're like some sort of antisocial neat, you might wish that you could be in love like the author of the poem, but that's not you actually wanting to emulate the tone or energy of the love poem itself. That's just you being sad and alone because it's been a year and a half since you broke up with your girlfriend and you hear she's getting engaged now, but you still haven't moved on. So you consider showing up to the wedding and causing a scene, but then you realize that wouldn't really do anything but make her hate you more. And it was that same kind of impulse-driven behavior that made her leave you in the first place. So no. Love poems are not cool. Now, if you're some kind of uneducated troglodyte, you probably haven't put all the pieces together yet. I've shown you why love poems have no depth, and why they're not cool, but for some reason your monkey brain just can't figure out how any of this proves that love poems are dumb. Well, you can stop wearing yourself out, kiddo, because I'll do all the thinking for you in... At a first glance, it may seem as if we have two completely disjointed pieces of evidence. Why love poems have no depth, and why love poems aren't cool, doesn't seem to be enough on its own to prove why love poems are dumb, does it? Well, you're actually completely wrong, and not even slightly right. I have devised a way to take these two proven statements and turn them into a model that can systematically prove that love poems are dumb. But before we get to that, let's sit down for a quick psychology lesson. Did you know that your brain actually processes information in two distinct ways? Those ways being emotionally and intelligently. Now, I don't want to get into all the nitty gritty nerd stuff like brain anatomy and science... things... But, here's my sources so you know I did my research. Basically, the way it works is that you've got certain parts of your brain that deal with processing logic and other complex functions, and other parts of the brain that deal with processing emotional information and reactions. This is important because basically everything in the world exists to provoke one of these two sections of your brain. It could be something obvious, like decision making, where various emotional and logical appeals are trying to sway your judgment. Or it could be something like choosing how to decorate your room, where the logical side of your head knows that all you need is a bed and a light source, but the emotional part of your brain really wants that 56 square foot tapestry of Thrax from Osmosis Jones. Getting back on topic, what I want you to take away from this little psychology lecture is that all things have a purpose, and that is either to appeal to you via logic or via your emotions. Now we can get back to discussing the previous two parts of this video and how they relate to love poems being dumb. Let's start with the thesis of part one. Love poems have no depth. In that part, we essentially decided that depth is a result of themes and ideas that make you think beyond the literal meaning of the work you're observing. If we say that something has no depth, we're saying it doesn't make us think, or provoke any complex intellectual response. In other words, things without depth don't appeal to the logical side of your brain, as they just don't bring anything to the table that's worth putting logical thought into. Now if we look at part two, you'll recall that we discuss things that don't have depth, but still evoke a meaningful reaction from us due to other factors. In our case specifically, that other factor was the coolness of the thing in question, as proven by its adherence to the dual tenets of coolality. If these things don't appeal to us due to their depth or logical significance, then by the process of elimination, it only makes sense that their appeal is emotional in origin. Now this is where we take our psychology info, along with the theses of parts 1 and 2, and put it all together. Based on the way that the brain functions, we reason that all things have a purpose to appeal to you either logically or emotionally. We then were able to make a logical appeal synonymous with whether or not something has depth and we were able to do the same with emotional appeals and the coolness of the object. 
Now we have the perfect model to test literally anything in the world and see what its true purpose is. That purpose being to appeal to us logically or emotionally. Let's test it out on a few things to prove its use. Citizen Kane, directed by Orson Welles. Honestly, it's kind of boring in my opinion, and having your dying words be the name of your childhood sled may be the most uncool choice of dying words I can possibly think of. But I can't deny the fact that it's a masterclass in filmmaking, and there's a reason that it's studied in film schools across America. We can place this into the depth category. Unicron, voiced by Orson Welles. He's a giant planet that eats planets, that then transforms into a giant robot that can eat robots. That's just cool. Obviously gets put into the cool category, no question. Oscar-nominated film, The Boss Baby. Now I know your first instinct would be to throw this in the depth category without a second thought, but if we test The Boss Baby himself against the tenets of coolality, he passes with flying colors. He carries this smug, confident aura, no matter where he goes. And it makes me want to become an eccentric baby CEO just like him if it means that I could imitate even a fraction of his swagger. That means that the Oscar-nominated film Boss Baby actually gets to sit in the coveted cool and deep section of the graph. Now that we've properly calibrated the test, we can see where love poems fall. Well, they aren't deep. We've already proven that. And they aren't cool either. But what does that mean? Well, like I said, the point of this model is to judge the true purpose of things by analyzing their appeals. And if love poems don't have a depth-based or cool-based appeal, then I guess that means they have no purpose. Wait, didn't we mention things without purpose at the beginning of this video? I'd say it's safe to give Dumb the working definition of not having any purpose. Like, at all. For those of you that still haven't caught on, let me spell it out for you. If love poems aren't cool, and they don't have depth, then they have no purpose. And things without a purpose are definitionally dumb. In other words, love poems are dumb. Hey guys, if you made it this far into the video, I just want to say thank you very much. I really appreciate it. It took a lot of time and effort to make. If you enjoyed this video, how about you consider clicking like to show your support. If you want to see more content like this in the future, why don't you click that subscribe button and ring that bell so that you get notified when future content gets uploaded to this channel. And if you really want to be able to show your support, you can always head over to my Patreon and become a member. At the $5 level, you gain access to an exclusive Discord server. At the $10 level, you get exclusive Patreon-only videos that will never be uploaded to this actual YouTube channel. And at the $20 level, I will come to your house and make you eggs of your choosing once a month. So there's a lot of content and value there for people that are interested, so why don't you head over?